Okay. Thanks, everybody. This is Malware Freak Show. I'm going to run through briefly of the agenda here. So I want to talk about who we are, how do we get the malware, analysis outline. I'm going to go through some samples. Um, That's where you're going to see some demos. This is going to be a, we have 50 slides and four demos to go through, so we're going to be going through this rather quickly. Um, and then we're going to finish up with some conclusions and give you a list of some tools we like to use. So who we are. I'm Nick Prococo. I'm the head of Spider Labs. I have about 14 years information security experience. My world of you know, information security and, and things like that started um, about 15, 16 years ago when I started um, dabbling around and running EFNet IRC servers back when I was in school. Um, used to dabble around with IRC bots, um, wrote a bunch of bots that, um, that emulated um, Eliza, um, trying to try do the Turing test online, even had a bot get asked out to prom. Um, so in, in, in this, is, this is Gibran Ilias. Hi guys, I'm Gibran. As uh, you can read, I've done uh, hundreds of security and incident responses, and uh, just recently I uh, got a master's degree from Northwestern University, so as you can see, I'm a good boy. Uh, and uh, we'll be uh, taking you on a ride, so uh, hopefully everyone's ready. Go. Okay, so you know, who, you know, who Sputter Labs is? So basically, um, we're a team within Trustwave. We've done incident response, penetration testing, um, application security tests for Trustwave clients, and, and sort of the mass, or the, or the, or the volume that we've done, we've done hundreds of security incidents we responded to. We've done um, you know, thousands of um, ethical hacking exercises, and, and hundreds of business applications have been tested through our labs. So how do we get the malware? Now, you know, we didn't set computers up on the internet and just allow malware to allow people to hack them and, and, and get malware on the computers. The malware we're going to show in, these, in, in the next several slides is actual malware that we took out of environments that were, that were compromised environments. Now, these environments were, were, were confirmed compromised. The, the, the data was confirmed taken from these environments and used for fraudulent purposes out in the real world. And so we're going to take you through that. And really, the basic method of acquisition, we do a lot of you know, live analysis, memory dumps, um, disk imaging, and then, of course, take all that stuff back to our labs, either in Chicago or London and, and, and churn through it to be able to produce some results. So analysis outline, we tried to organize each of these samples in sort of a, you know, sort of a cohesive manner. So basically, we're going to go through you know, the basic architectures and really be able to try to tell a story about the environment these were taken out of. So what did the architecture look like? What were the problems that we, we, we saw within the environment? Um, what tools were found? And really, um, you know, you know, what did the hackers leave behind? What were the traces that we found? And then, of course, the installation vector. How did the tools get into the environment in the first place? And then do some static dynamic analysis, show you what we learned about the malware, and um, how did data get out of the environment? And of course, on um, what you're probably you know, really looking forward to seeing. We're actually going to demo this stuff live. So we'll jump in the sample A. So now, basically, this environment, this was a casino club in Las Vegas. So it's someplace not too far from this hotel. Um, you know, visually, showing you the visual aspects of the environment so you can see what the environment looked like. Um, you have sort of over on the, the right-hand side of that screen, you have the internet, right? Everybody knows what that is. And then you have a firewall, uh, you know, sitting out there. Um, and basically a back-of-the-house server. This is a server that you know, basically is used for processing the data that's being pr transmitted um, and used by the front-of-the-house front systems. And so the POS terminals you see, um, these are things that range from little small cal you know, bulky calculator type devices that people are swiping cards through up to your touchscreen computers that are being used um, in clubs. And in specifically in this environment, these were the touchscreen systems. You know, when you go to a club, go to a bar, Server takes your credit card, they swipe your card through the system, they, they type in what you have, you know, a couple of beers, a martini, and, they, um, and, and off goes the data. And so that's what was being used here um, in this environment. So what were the problems that were found in this environment? So you know, very, very basic stuff. So um, remote desktop was allowed um, from the internet into the club point of sale system. So the previous slide I showed you this point of sale server out there, um, remote desktop, you know, wide open from the internet. Um, we found common passwords, weak passwords in the environment, and specifically um, the point of sale system that was being used, um, and the point of sale system name, and the, and the name of the system was also used as the password. Um, and also, it, it basically, you know, it makes it very, very easy for the people to, I guess, you know, the IT guys to admin these systems, but it made it easy for the attackers to get in. Um, we found out that antivirus hadn't been updated um, on, the pass on the point of sale systems for at least eight months. Um, so that was, that was a big problem there. And then, of course, you know, basically the customer data we saw in the system was carried over from two previous owners. So if you think about this, you have, you're running a restaurant, um, or you know, basically in this case, you're running a, running a bar, and, and you go out of business, or well, you're going to try to sell the stuff on eBay. And so this happened twice with these systems that we looked at. Um, someone sold them, up on, sold them online, or they sold them to somebody else, and no one bothered to wipe the system. So we found customer data um, from two previous owners um, that were live on these systems. 
And of course, this casino's network was very, very flat. The club that we investigated was connected right on the same exact flat network as the reservation systems, the same exact flat networks as the fast food places that were in the lobby, and, and the gift shops, wide open. Anybody, anybody who plugs into any of those networks could navigate to any of the systems in, in the environment. Tools we found in the environment, we're going to go into more detail. You probably can't read, any, read this anyways from, the, from after, after the third or fourth row, so we're going to skip past this. Basically, installation vector. How, how, did, how did the attacker get into the environment? Well, of course, remote desktop. I re we already talked about that. The targeted account was POS user. The attackers that are, that are launching these attacks, they have a whole laundry list of the point of sale username and passwords uh, available to them. They know exactly what the default passwords are. Scan out there, found remote desktop, try the default username and passwords, and they're in the environment. Basically, once they were in, they downloaded an SFX archive, um, and basically, basically from a website that we, that, that we actually were able to um, you know, navigate onto, and, and, and it was still up and running when we were doing the investigation, but it was um, Drug Zeller, and we're not going to show you the rest of the name there. Um, but basically, SFX archive had a key logger and, and PuTTY executable within it. Um, the other, other interesting aspect is that the attacker then went and purchased, using, the, using the, the, the BARS computers, went online, purchased a SMTP server to install it on the club point of sale system. Um, you know, as noted that was on the previous slide, really the only way into the environment was, already, it was remote desktop. The only way out of the environment was, was through the point of sale system, the point of sale server. The front end terminals had no, no, no ability to get out of the environment. And then, of course, they used VNC to manage those systems because the point of sale terminals had no keyboard, really no mouse. And so if they needed to manage it or do upgrades, the, the, the IT folks would just VNC from the point of sale server, and that's how they would get in the environment. Here's a, here's a listing of the directory. You want to take this? Sure. So as you can see, we uh, got into their uh, server, and we see a lot of interesting tools. Uh, basically, these are some of them are keylogger executables, some of them are remote desktop crackers, and so forth. So, and this is a screenshot as uh, Nick just told you that they, they actually bought an SMTP server from uh, the, the merchant's machine. So that's a screenshot for that at $69 that they spent. And anyone want to guess uh, whose credit card they used? The, that's from the merchant. All right, so what does xxx.exe do? All right, so what they do, this is basically a packer, a packed SFX archive. So when they installed it, they installed it in a folder that's, you know, that's uh, in, Program files Outlook folder, so they could get hidden from uh, you know IT administrators and you know security administrators who are looking for uh, malware. Uh, so as you can see, uh, Windows Security is one of the other folders that they install their things in. Uh, see Windows System 32, malware favorite, uh, and then other one you know the attack the hackers that are lazy they basically install it in C Program Files BPK folder. Um, so basically, this keylogger has um, you know ability to hide from task manager, start menu, system tray. So all you know, if a regular person, regular IT person takes a look at it, you will, uh, if you were to take a look at it, you wouldn't be able to tell that a keylogger is running on the system. Um, and basically, the file uh, that they store the credit card track data that they steal from the systems, uh, it's actually an encrypted, statically encrypted file, which uh, could only be opened by Keylogger's uh, log viewer. And that's a great way to hide the data. So, you know, if a regular person is looking at bpk.dat file, and even if you try to open it with Notepad, uh, you won't be able to see the contents because it's all encrypted. Um, Keylogger, you know, that's one of the more interesting things uh, about the keylogger when we were investigating it. It takes uh, screenshots at uh, regular intervals. So basically, uh, not only that it had, uh, you know, my screenshot, uh, you know, activities of uh, my activities, it also had attackers' activities. So when the attackers were going into their website, it was taking screenshots every 30 seconds and it was uh, storing in a hidden directory. All right, uh, so basically now I'm going to show you some of the options of this uh, keylogger. Um, as you can see, it's, uh, it's a commercially available keylogger, but uh, they, had it a, they had a very uh, customized uh, version of this keylogger. So as you can see, you can hide this uh, program uh, icon, and you, there's, a, there's a key combination that only the attacker knows to get the, this op, options menu up. And you could even hide it from uh, control of delete and uh, Basically, you can run on Windows startup so that the keylogger comes up even when you boot up the systems. All right, that's another screen. That's basically for the visual surveillance that I was talking about. You know, it didn't even spare attackers' activity. So they were taking uh, screenshots every 15 minutes um, and medium resolution. They didn't want anything big. Uh, they're kind of nice. Um, this is for uh, the emailing of uh, the key, uh, the logs, the key logger output, and basically uh, what this is saying that every 30 minutes uh, they were s sending logs via email. 
Uh, that's another screen. Uh, now the attackers, uh, basically, they could have uh, monitored every single key typed on the keyboard uh, on the hacked computer. But they, um, they, they wanted to cut their work. So they basically started monitoring just the applications that contain credit card data. So uh, on a point of sale system, they only put uh, you know, one application that was known to process credit card transactions. So as Nick said, if you go to a bar, you swipe at a cr uh, credit card, the application that actually uh, processes those transactions, that's the application that they were monitoring. And um, do you want to get? Yeah, sure. So, so, so basically, so these are some of the logs that we collected. Basically, this is you know from this keylogger. We had to black those out, but those are actually track data logs um, from the, from the actual swipes that were going on inside the, in, inside this bar. Um, but basically, you know, they're, they're, that that the keylogger was then emailing this off to a, an email address, a Montana email address, um, Montana you know, in, at at a very at, at a very um, at, a, at a free email domain. Um, here's some other screenshots here. One thing interesting is that um, you can see that the attacker was actually also tripped up in their own keylogger, um, and when they were logging into their own FTP site, we, we were able to obtain their password. Um, and the, the other the other thing here, you can see where they were actually copying and pasting the um, the, the, the the serial code um, or the or the the serial key for the for the keylogger itself. Um, when they were, or not for the keylogger, for, but for the um, SMTB gateway. Here's some other logs we, we obtained from the SMTP gateway. You can see some things going on um, where they're actually sending that data out, um, sending it out to um, you know various uh, to, the, to the email address. We had to black black out a lot of things here to sort of protect the innocent, but um, but you can see sort of the, the data going back and forth. So right now we're going to jump into a live demo, and, and Jabron's going to take you through um, sort of the installation and the execution of the of the, of the specific piece of malware. All right, all right. So we're going to do a live demo for you in our uh, VMware machine. Um, Okay, one thing that um, uh, we didn't mention was that the POS terminals themselves, they weren't able to go online. So what they had to do to get data out was to install, they installed an SMTP server on the back of house server because they had internal communications. So the, extern, uh, the SMTP server was running on a private IP address and that back of house server which had connection to the internet, that's, that was acting as a, an email proxy to send data out. All right. Okay, you guys can see everything okay. All right, so we're gonna jump right into the malware. It's a keylogger malware demo that we're doing. So if you see this icon, uh, who wants to guess what this application looks like? So it's, it's an obfuscated application. Putty, there you go. So on the face of it, it looks like a putty application, but you know, behind the scenes, uh, you're, I'm gonna show you what it does. So basically when this malware runs, it uh, installs a keylogger and you would actually see an SFX archive uh, you know, being uh, cracked there. So I'm gonna open two folders, basically. I'm, the one is gonna be a temp folder, and one's gonna be a C Windows security folder, and that's the folder where the keylogger installs its files in. So here's the, key, uh, the security folder where the files are gonna go. So I'm just gonna run this, and then minimize this folder. So as you can see, as you guessed it, it's a uh, putty on the uh, front end. You don't know what happened in the background, right? Uh, so if I close this, you'll see that the keylogger files are put in uh, the security folder. And this temp directory where the SFX archive uh, was kind of um, uh, extracting, you can see this, is, this has the putty application. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna show how attackers take the data. As I mentioned earlier that they were only monitoring the POS application. So I'm actually gonna go to the folder where the POS, POS application resides, um, and that is this bin folder. Uh, so, you know, if I put something in notepad.exe, it won't uh, detect because it's not monitoring notepad.exe. So what I have to do is basically copy notepad uh, from system32 folder. All right, so I'm gonna copy notepad from system32 folder. I'm gonna place it in this uh, bin folder because this is one of the processes that they're uh, monitoring. And I'm gonna change this name to a payment application. And then I'm gonna open this up and I'm gonna feed track data to this file. So this, this is basically, you know, we're, we're kind of um, tricking the malware to think that this notepad.exe is a point of sale application. So anything that I swipe in here, so these uh, magnetic stripe readers uh, that you guys see on bars, these are basically keyboard input. So when you swipe credit cards uh, here, it bas the computer basically takes it as a keyboard input and that's how it logs. So I'm gonna swipe uh, a credit card um, here. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, so one thing I want to show you is that, um, you know, once, when we looked at this, file, uh, this folder before, the bpk.dat file was in there. And as you can see, you know, as I swipe uh, credit card here, uh, you'll actually see um, uh, basically this, this bpk.dat file, file is going to grow. So right now it's only 1KB. And I'm just going to keep swiping the card. Hopefully Dark Tangent doesn't mind. Uh. All right. I think we got enough of it. Maybe you could uh, memorize it. Okay. So now we're going to go back to that folder where uh, the keyboard uh, keylogger is uh, putting its output file. And this is the security folder. As you can see, it's two uh, kilobytes right now. So I'm going to try to open this with the notepad first just to kind of show you that, you know, if you're a regular security administrator, uh, what you're going to see in this output file. Um, so here we go. I'm going to open it with the WordPad, and all you see is just garbage. So all this data is uh, encrypted in the keylogger's uh, format. Okay, so what we're going to have to do to actually see the data is actually install the keylogger, and we're going to install a legit version uh, in a bit. And that legit version is in my supporting tools. So I'm going to install a trial version. This is basically a five day trial. Uh, don't try this at home, obviously. All right, I have to agree to the terms. And I'm going to call it a legit <laughs> keylogger. All right, so we're going to just install, uh, you know, launch the installed program so we can uh, view the log file that the attacker uh, created. And as you can see, they want to thank you for being attacked. And there we go. We're going to go to options, logging, view log. And as I mentioned before, all the output is being stored in C window security folder. So I'm going to go ahead and open this log file in uh, C windows security folder. And there you go. So it's, uh, the keylogger is basically monitoring two processes, explorer.exe and iber.exe, which uh, I mentioned this is a point of sale application process. We basically just tricked it, uh, tricked the malware to think that notepad.exe is actually iber.exe. So all this track data that you can see, uh, they're taking it home. And that's basically how they ta take the data. Now one, one thing I want to mention here is that uh, now that security controls are being widely adopted and the databases of these point of sale applications are being encrypted and the data is being uh, encrypted in transit. Well, what I mean by that is from uh, front of house machine to the back of house machine. Uh, the only way for them to take the data is the data in transit. And this keylogger is a perfect way to do it because as soon as you swipe, uh, you know, it's intercepting uh, the track data. So that uh, basically concludes the um, uh, keylogger demo. And you can actually save this file as HTML or whatever you want when you have it on site. And then they basically sell these credit cards to the black markets. All right. Jump back in. Yeah. All right. So I'm just basically going to um, go to my snapshot. And as you can see, my snapshot's name is Colin Shepard. He's probably around somewhere. He's my boss. Thank you, Colin. All right. So while it restores, um, we're going to jump on uh, the second piece of malware that we found. We're going to demo that as well later on. But uh, for now, we're just going to uh, suspend this machine and take it when uh, Nick is uh, ready. OK, so now the second piece of malware we obtained from a hotel in New York. So we're going to go through that example here. So basically, the architecture, as you see here, looks rather similar to what we saw in the casino, the casino club. Um, but one, one minor, minor difference here is, or actually major difference, is that this was a, um, was a chain of hotels. And so there was more than, more than one environment connected here. And so you sort of see the, the router there leading up to corporate. Um, that's a key aspect of sort of how this compromise took place. Um, but then you also see we also have multiple machines here. We have a gift shop, a restaurant, a bar, um, central processing server. 
Uh, one thing to note when we when we are you know we're sort of looking at the problems here, um, when we have, have when we've done these investigations, we've often you know stay at the same hotel that these investigations are taking place, um, and and the and, and people on our team have actually no noticed that when you plug into the hotel room, oftentimes you're actually able to reach all these other, all these servers that are around the environment. Um, so you know the the IT administrators probably made um, one major mistake by actually plugging the switches in the wrong in the wrong place. So you know, keep in, keep that in mind when you're when you're actually you know using hotel hotel wire hotel internet access. We also seen that the wireless internet access plugged into the same exact network as the as the reservation systems um, in, in a lot of the hotels. Um, but basically, the problems we saw here on um, the firewall was a consumer level um, firewall. So this is you know, sort of a major major hotel um, that that was using a consumer layer, consumer grade firewall for their for their for their firewall. Um, but basically, allowed RDP in into many many systems into the into the environment. Um, a couple of things, the hotel management systems and the point of sale systems um, were, were, hadn't been patched in a number of number of years. And in, in this specific case, since 2004 and 2006, they had not run any updates in the environment. Um, weak username and passwords, actually the, the administrator password was NIMDA um, in the environment, which made things probably easy for the IT guy to remember, but it also made it very easy for anybody who's trying to guess that password. Um, they had no antivirus and no anti-malware or anything running on any of these systems. Um, really didn't matter much because, you know, like, like you've seen in, in Gibran's demo, um, in which you'll see in some of the other demos, a lot of the malware that we find has, 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 was custom created or just, just compiled um, directly before they actually put them in the environment. So, you know, having, having, having antivirus in the environment really wouldn't help there. But again, no network segmentation between any of the environments at all. Tools found, um, you know, some things to note here, you know, basically the stuff that's highlighted in black, we're going to show you some things in um, more detail about it, but there are some other tools, you know, basically were, were, were associated with, um, with this attack as well. So installation vector, again, this was remote desktop, remote desktop live on the internet. Um, basically, it targeted two different accounts. You have your administrator account, um, the backup account was targeted, and then SQL debugger account was, was targeted as well. Again, they downloaded the attacker, um, attacker toolkit, and then, um, and then basically one key difference here is that they didn't just target the one environment. When they got into the environment, they actually, um, you know, you know, basically you know, were able to connect to all the other environments in this, in this chain of hotels, and they used um, PS Exec um, to, to, deploy their, to deploy this malware. One thing to note, you know, this malware, p malware we're talking about here is actually a memory dumper malware. So it's, it's a bit different than the keystroke logger. Um, it actually targets memory. So we're going we're gonna to show you more of that. Some static analysis. Now, there's two components um, to this malware package. There was a communication component, um, and basically, this 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 service or this this piece of the malware actually ran as a service. Um, it makes an SSL connection over up, up to a system in, in South Korea, um, and basically it had some anti-debugging features built into it. So basically, if you try to run it through Explorer, it would do things like try to lock the workstation, try to um, you know terminate any processes that are running, and close all terminal sessions, and basically try to disrupt what you're trying to do um, if you're trying to run it as a it run it through. Explorer. Um, it also checks to see if it's running in VM, so it sort of shows thwarts the things that we're doing here. So we're actually not going to demo this aspect of it um, because we're using VM as a demo. Um, but basically, if it, it detects VM running in the environment, it actually tries to tries to shut itself down and shut down the entire computer. It also has you know all the strings it was using to search for things in the environment. Um, it actually encrypted them and then decrypted them upon upon run. Other interesting things. So when we when we ran the when we ran this tool and actually decrypted the um, the strings, um, we we found this 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 little bit of um, little note that the attacker left here. So one one thing interesting is that basically said, I currently do not know what I'm intend to do with this, but I accept the fact I must do some limited experiments. Um, so it's pretty interesting that limited experiments included about 80 hotels. Um, Basically, here this is the this is the really active piece that we're going to talk about and we're going to demo. Um, this is you know WinManagement.exe. Um, it was basically a normal Windows binary. Um, it, it referenced a lot of things in it. You know WinSock API it had some FTP commands in it. And then one thing you probably see very small down there that's actually the regular expressions um, to search for track one and track two data. And um, track one and track two data for those who aren't familiar with it, if you pull out your credit card out of your pocket, the data that's stored on the back of your credit card in Magic Stripe um, is essentially um, it, it's it's not in, it's not encrypted. It's essentially just encoded on the back of that card, just like Gibran showed you in the, in the notepad demo. Um, but basically, these, this piece of malware um, is going to parse memory, and every single time it finds um, track one or track two data, it's going to log it to a file. 
So you know, basically, you know, some things. You know, we're going to walk through this stuff because he's going to actually show you this. Um, but basically, the big item here is that um, it's it's designed to monitor one of eight point of sale systems. Now we've seen later versions of this that sort of expand their scope, um, but the attackers really know what they're looking for. They're not just sort of taking a guess and saying, "Let's launch it in the environment and just start dumping processes." This this executable actually was compiled um, with with the intent to find one of eight different point of sale systems and and, and, and take the data out of memory. So. Um, some more data here about sort of the data, how the data got out of the environment. Um, so basically, the, the, the tool itself, another process that was sort of used in conjunction with this was actually cr creating encrypted RAR files. Um, something we really noted um, in our investigations was that the encrypted RAR files, we didn't know what the passwords were. So you know, we, we went through a cracking exercise and found it easier um, because we took, we took memory dumps. We actually found the passwords in memory on several of the systems we, we, we obtained. Um, and then using the same password scheme, basically they use the server name, uh, the system name in their password scheme, we were able to then decrypt all the other locations, RAR files. Really, when it was all said and done, there was about 350,000 cards um, that we obtained from the RAR files that were pulled from these systems. And then sort of propagation, and like I mentioned earlier, um, the attackers were, were just basically able to, 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 to leapfrog from this one single environment and, and deploy, the, deploy this tool on all the other environments that, they, that were sort of in the chain of systems. So here's, here's DeBron with the live demo. Okay. All right, before I do this demo, I just want to ask, uh, how many people have uh, memory in their computers? <laughs> All right, so this is, this is going to be fun because, uh, you know, this malware is taking the data from the memory. So, you know, how, how are secure application that you're running? You know, you're, even if you're running TrueCrypt and all, you know, there's a point in time where your data, it remains unencrypted in the memory. So watch out for this. All right, so I'm going to resume my virtual machine. Okay, so this, this is not a single executable. This is going to have uh, three pieces uh, to this. And uh, I'm going to demo all three of them. All right, so as you can see, there are three files that this uh, memory uses to steal uh, credit card track data from the systems. That uh, CSR SVC, this is the actual memory dumper. And as Nick mentioned, uh, there are about eight point of sale applications that it's monitoring. And um, so we're, we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to try to trick uh, this malware to think that notepad.exe is one of the point, point of sale applications. This DNS MGR.exe that, um, that was compiled on the box, this is basically a track data parser. So when you have the huge memory dumps uh, from the processes, it looks at the memory dumps and it looks for uh, credit card track data and then it takes it out of that file. That winmgmt.exe, now this winmgmt.exe, if you're a network administrator, you probably know that it's a legit Windows file, but in this case, uh, they, they, they're using that uh, as a malicious purpose. This, that's their binary, not the one that's found on our machine. Okay, so we're gonna go with the demo. Okay, so as we can see, there are only three files here right now, and it's going to increase, so watch out for that. Um, so basically this winmgmt.exe, if you run it as in a standalone binary, it won't run. It will give you an error. Uh, to install that, you will actually have to have the install switch. And once you do that, as you can see, uh, it installs it as a service. So what these, the intent of the malware is to stay persistent on the system because you know, they're taking the data in transit. So they want to have their presence in the system even after you reboot the systems. So it's installed as a service. So again, if you're a regular IT administrator, you look at the service, you're not going to doubt the service because it says Windows Management Help Service Install. All right, so luckily we have uh, th these uh, malware writers uh, have a debug option and they code it. So <laughs> we're going to run this malware in a debug mode. So basically just uh, look out for two things here. Uh, so what we see here, we, we see three files. So when I run it in debug mode, it's going to create a mem dump folder, which is going to be the location that memory dumps are created in. And then you're going to see two more processes here in the task, uh, in the system tray. So it's going to be that memory dumper, and the second process is going to be the track data parser. All right, so let's go ahead with that. Okay, so as I promised, we got the mem dump folder. Now notice it has no file in here because uh, it, it's not finding the process that it wants to monitor, but it's got these two applications, wonderful applications that are going to monitor uh, the system for track data. And they 
run pretty much hidden from the system. It's just that I'm running it in debug mode. That's why you're seeing all this data here. All right, so what we're going to do is um, first I'm going to just run uh, the, tr you know, I'm going to feed the track data to notepad.exe to kind of show you what it, the malware does with it. Poor dark tracking agent. We got him again. Okay. So as you can see, I'm feeding a legitimate uh, track data to this uh, notepad application and this malware is not responding. It's not doing anything. Uh, otherwise it would say something uh, in here where it's monitoring. So we can tell that it's not monitoring notepad.exe. So what we're going to do is uh, basically trick the malware again and uh, rename notepad.exe uh, as the name was of a point of sale application. So I'm going to go to this system32 folder again, notepad.exe, I'm going to call it cdi.exe which is a point of sale system application. And now I'm going to have these two here again, cdi.exe. So as soon as I do that, you're going to see that it's going to create a dump. And this dump is being created in this uh, mem dump folder. And you can see it has the name of the application, which is, uh, it's thinking that it's a point of sale application. And it has the process ID and the name of the dump. So right now in this uh, folder, we only have a dump for about 238 kilobyte. But this dump is going to increase as we feed data to the point of sale application. And we're going to see it right now. So cdi.exe is running right now. Uh, and I'm going to feed track data to it. One and a two, one and a three. OK. So now that I've uh, fed track data to this uh, uh, payment application process, um, you know, pretty soon we're going to see here that this, uh, th it's going to create another dump. And uh, it's going to find track data in the file. So it usually takes a dump every two minutes, but in the interest of time, I'm actually going to trigger this application to create a dump. So I'm just going to save this, app, you know, this file as trigger the dump. All right. Yeah, we'll stay simple. So what you're going to see pretty soon, actually you see it right now, the malware is pretty fast. It's running faster than uh, I'm running. So basically it's found, it has found track data one, uh, track one data. And uh, you know, pretty soon you're going to see an attacker output file which uh, they take home in the same memory dumper folder. So as you can see, that it's, it just created a file. The, this file wasn't here before, dirmon.chm. Uh, and this is basically, you know, it looks like a help file. So again, they're trying to, you know, fool the IT administrators or security administrator because they'll think, okay, it's a CHM file. How harmful could it be? But we're going to open this in uh, Notepad. So. So you're going to see how easy, you know, what, how neat of their output is. So I'm going to open this in WordPad again. And there you go. So basically what they're taking home is, um, you know, this neat of a file, grmon.chm. And it's, it tells them that, hey, this is where the dump was. Uh, I found uh, track one data. And then I found track two data. And uh, the data is there as well. And it's, it's pretty good at uh, sorting out duplicates as well. So I've, you know, it's, it's doing a lot of things. So that basically concludes our uh, memory dumper malware. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that you know I've I've shown you the demo for only the track data, but just imagine how much stuff goes through your memory. You know, if you're using Firefox, you're typing in your uh, social security number, you're typing in um, you know your password. You, even even the passwords that go through SSL, they can be in the memory. So anyone who uses memory in their computers, you got to be careful here. And uh, it's basically, you know, uh, it has PGP keys, TrueCrypt keys, basically everything that, that you type. And one thing that I want to uh, mention here is that the keylogger malware, you know, even though it's, it's all nice and stuff, it's only, it only grabs the input that you guys feed to it. So if you're typing in the input, that's what keylogger is going to get. Memory is a little different. Memory is actually more risky. I call it a keylogger and steroids, basically. Because not only that your input is being monitored, the input, you know, the, the party that you're communicating with, like if you're in, uh, on, you know, AIM, chatting with someone on AOL, you type in some info, your, your buddy types in some info, that's going to stay in memory. So if you're p parsing for the right stuff, uh, memory has a, a lot of good info. So just watch out for that. So that basically concludes our memory dumper malware. Nick's going to show you another malware, which is even more interesting. So watch out for that.
Okay, so you now we're going to jump back. We're going to jump into the back into the presentation. Hold on, you got to refresh that. The machine. Okay. So the next piece of malware that we're going to talk about, um, basically, um, it's based upon some investigations we performed, and it's it's based upon more of a more of a proof of concept, and you know, basically the the investigations that we've performed. Oh. No, but okay. just going on. So um, basically, the investigation we performed, um, various systems have been attacked with, with, with what we're calling credentialed malware. And sort of to define that for you, we're going to go into the next slide, but just something to note is that what we're showing in this demo, um, we're not talking about any vulnerabilities in any video poker system. Um, we, didn't, we, we didn't find any vulnerabilities in a video poker system, just sort of leaving that as a disclaimer here for everybody in the room. Um, but really, the purpose of this demo is to talk about and introduce the concept of credentialed malware. And so what is credential malware? Just like any other piece of malware, but the, the idea and concept that once you get this malware into a system, you as the attacker or the person who's running this malware is now able to, to dispatch credentials in the form of tokens um, to other people to be able to use it. And you could set roles and, roles, and, roles and tasks that they're able to perform. Um, specifically, this type of malware is targeting kiosk-based environments, so places where, 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 where you're not able to maybe get information out via a network interface, um, but you're able to walk up to that system and actually perform some transactions. So basically, the, these tokens are being used as authentication tokens to trigger various aspects of the malware. And then, of course, in the organized crime world, you could think of a sort of hierarchy where you can then rent these tokens um, to do various functions. And you could then shut them off, turn them back on, um, and control who has access to this malware that you now have on a system. So to sort of introduce that concept, we decided to choose a video poker system. So to, to show the architecture here, we have over on the left-hand side, or the, sort of the green screen there, um, you have the video poker desktop. And so that's the video poker system um, that everybody probably walks around the casino. You see it, you know, a thousand instances of them sitting out there. Um, and then over on the left-hand side, um, the, the, the credentialed token that we're going to use in this, in this demo is actually a voucher. So everybody has seen vouchers before. Um, we have some of them here printed up. Um, it's a $20 voucher, so basically you insert that into the machine, it allows you to, to play the game, you lose all your money, and then you, um, and then you sort of get up and go home. Um, in, in, in this case, now we have the casino network and we also have the casino itself. So some common problems in this type of environment. Um, you know, you're talking about physical access to these devices. So number of machines in the environment, um, you know, d does the eyes in the sky actually watch the repair people? You know, you walk around casinos, you see people opening up machines all the time, something jams, you know, something's broken, something burns out, um, they're replacing boards. Who's watching those people? Are they keeping track of what they're actually doing? You, you, passwords are difficult to manage. Um, you know, in our investigations, looking at systems in hotels and casinos and other various places, they use the same password on every single system. Do you think that the password's unique on every single video poker machine? Probably not. Um, also, you know, are, you, are you running antivirus on these video poker machines? Probably not. And then, of course, under the hardened case, you have, you know, really it's just a, a low-end PC, other, other keyboard ports, USB ports, you know, what is there? And then, of course, what, what OS are they running? You know, we don't know, you know, how often are they patched? Probably not very often. So installation vectors, top possible scenarios here, physical attack, someone walks up who has a legitimate you know, you know, need to get into the system, they install a USB key fob or something in the environment, install the malware, you know, it executes and now it's running on the system. Another scenario is the malware is placed on the system from the, from the, from the distributor or the manufacturer um, and it's there running live. Now one thing to note is that you know, the, the tokens that we're going to talk about and show you, that's what's used to actually trigger this malware. So you as a normal user walking up to the system, you're not going to be able to, to know that the malware is running on the system at all. Basically, the, the, the token concept I mean, what we're introducing here is sort of you know, multiple types of levels of things. So we're talking about single function um, you know, authentication cards where we're talking user vouchers. Basically, that triggers one aspect of it. This may be given to a mule who you say go to these various video poker machines, insert it into the system, and, um, and, and basically um, you know, tell me what it says on the screen. That might be one function of a mule. A multifunction could be someone who's actually deployed this malware. They're able to do other commands and, and run various other things. And of course, if the malware doesn't see a user voucher in place, they actually, it just continues on. It thinks that someone's sitting down playing a game. Um, nothing ever really happens. So the functions we put into this, this demo here, so basically your keyboard input is very limited. You walk up to a video poker machine, you have the hold keys, you have your deal, your max bet, and some various other keys, but you don't have a full keyboard. So you have to take, really take use of those you know, if, you're, if you're gonna write malware for this. Um, so in examples here, we have, you know, you hit, if, you, if you authenticate with the, with the video poker machine, you hit the hold one button, it unsolves it. So you can sort of wipe the tracks that this malware's you know, been running on there. Hold, you know, hit number two, um, display stats on the system. It tells you how many uses have been taking place with this malware. It tells you, you know, ver you know various other things. 
And then, of course, you can modify the credits. And the thing that's even, even more interesting is being able to modify the credits or shift the odds. And when you modify the credits, you can enter in what you want that system to actually have on it and then, of course, cash it out. So propagation, similar type of thing. If these things are all networked connect together, what can you actually do from there? Um, I think we talked about it in some other demos. So basically here we're going to boot up the, the video poker machine and show you this live. All right. Okay, so I'm going to come back to my virtual machine and we're going to see the video poker malware. And uh, don't try this here because you um, could get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, so we have the malware booting up here. So like, while it's booting up, we'll, or actually this is the video poker system booting up. So while it's booting up, um, really to show you, talk to a little more about the vouchers. So we have the, in my hand I have the, um, the $20 voucher. This is a legitimate voucher that we're gonna use. We have um, one, of the tr one of the user vouchers. Um, this one will actually trigger the single function. And then we have a, have a voucher that actually will trigger um, the multi-function card. So we're gonna go through and actually you know, swipe those in. Okay. So here goes the $20 voucher. Ron's gonna okay. enter into the system. There you go. So we got twenty dollar voucher going in. So you see, there's twenty credits on the screen. So now we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and, and, and play. You know, max bet it. You see the bets go twenty dollars there. Of course, what happens it happens to everybody here as you go through and, and then you lose. <laughs> so now we're gonna we're gonna swipe the single use voucher. So through the system, and and, and show it see what happens there. Single-use voucher active, is, is intercepted by the malware. Um, it actually pops up the display stats here, so you can see information about the voucher or about the about the system that we're looking at. Uh, IP address tells you the name of the malware that's running on there. Um, sort of the odd shift, sort of concept of, of actually changing the odds on, on, on the system. And of course, then you just sort of you know move on and you you clear it out, and it goes back to a regular regular screen. Next piece, we're going to actually demo the the multi-use voucher here. So now a couple different functions here. So now this pops up a menu, like I showed you earlier, the menu of doing various things. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is actually option three, and it tells us it shifted the odds plus one. So basically put it in our favor. Um, and you can sit down and do that, and you clear the screen, and now you start playing. You may have, you, in, in various aspects here, that they actually may be able to rent someone a voucher that actually only lets them do that. So they can only shift the odds. They can't do anything else. Um, and so you can put a price on that. Now we're going to run, that, run another multi-use voucher through the system um, that's going to let us do something else. So we're going to pick option four, clear through it, and we're actually going to go be able to go through and actually um, modify the credits. And we only have five keys to play with here, so you know, you're, you're really the combinations of five, four, three, two, one. So we're going to actually modify and add 54,321 credits to the system. And of course you see in the bottom left-hand corner we've added those credits. In a, in a normal scenario, you maybe want to bet that bet those credits, or maybe you want to cash out. And so, cash out. so now we've cashed out, and our system's cleared. No one has any has any any, any knowledge that we've actually done this. I'm sitting in front of it in a casino. Okay. okay. So now we're going to jump in. We have we only have about eight minutes left, so we're going to quickly go through the last one All and right. see if we actually can can actually show you that demo. Okay. All right, so this last sample we have is uh, a restaurant in Michigan. Um, basically the similar problems as the first two malware, you know, uh, these little merchants, they don't have a full-time IT staff, so they have uh, a third-party ID in integrator uh, supporting them. So they like to come into the systems with ease. You know, they don't like to travel anytime there's a broken printer. So they have uh, VNC open from outside, so they could just control all the machines from outside. Uh, similar thing, uh, you know, no egress filtering, no outbound filtering on the back of house server and the point of sale terminals with full internet access allowed. So the problems in here were, you know, obviously VNC was allowed from outside, which is a big no-no. Uh, the, the systems had a weak password. Uh, actually, for 18 of those restaurants in Michigan, the integrator was using the same password. And the passwords were basically, the, the credentials were admin and support. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, the point of sale terminals were not running antivirus server. Uh, there was uh, unrestricted internet access and basically uh, same passwords for all the systems in the region. 
Uh, this is basically the malware list uh, from th that system. And uh, what I want to show here is that this malware is kind of special because what it does is it has an IRC bot and uh, when you install the malware, it, it looks for a POS application version and then it tells, it creates the malware on site and it tells the malware to monitor the ports of that specific point of sale system. So uh, this IRC bot does that and then there's a custom packet sniffer. And then all the data is being uh, placed in a C export folder and then uploaded to uh, FTP server. So basically for this uh, malware, the, even the attackers had to install Microsoft.NET Framework. Uh, I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, it was only sniffing uh, the, the TCP traffic on four ports and then basically uh, the files were uh, IP address .send .cap and IP address read.cap. And the data was being uploaded to a server in uh, Munich, Germany. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to have time to show the malware. So we're just going to go to the conclusion slide and uh, we're going to, uh, yeah. Actually, we'll, we'll just see the conclusion in there. So um, I just want to show you the additional comments here. We um, got that, we, we actually um, told uh, FBI about it and the server was raided and we found out that 18 of the locations were sending data to that uh, particular FTP server and uh, we are basically investigating about six of them right now. So we're going to hit the conclusions uh, right now. Uh, so as you can see, malware is dominating. Computer memory is the target to extract sensitive data. One thing that I forgot to mention on the memory dumper malware was that, you know, I've, I've basically seen, I have a pretty uh, funny relationship with these malware writers. Basically, I've seen them grow. Uh, you know, the, the, I've seen the malware grow. So before, malware used to take the full kernel dumps and put it in uh, uh, the, the, the hard disk. And the, the, you know, as you can imagine, when it creates too many dumps, uh, the system is going to run out of disk. So do you want to guess what the solution of the merchants was when they were seeing low disk space on their servers? Add more disk. You got it. So they basically purchased uh, Western Digital Drives. They were putting data in and they were deleting actually their legit files. So they were deleting their accounting files to fit, uh, you know, to accommodate the attacker's uh, memory dumps. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. And um, as I said, uh, you know, they, they've, they've grown they've, they, they, and it's going to keep growing. So watch out for this memory dumper malware and you heard it here first. Uh, you're going to see this memory dumper malware grow a lot and take a lot of your personal data. So watch out. Sure, yeah. And, and the, the other aspects here, you know, really the, what we're finding is the companies are really not learning. So you know, many of the investigations, like you saw from the initial, initial, in, initial um, you know, way that the attackers are getting any of them, I mean, these are simple tactics. I mean, guessing passwords using RDP or VNC. Very, very simple. And, but historically, what, they're not do, what they were doing before was you know, basically smash and grab is, is, is done. They're not popping into the environments and actually just, you know, just deleting, you know, just moving the files off the system. They're actually sticking around for a very long time. We didn't mention in some of the examples, some of these attackers were in these environments for, for up to two years, um, sitting around and doing the things that, that before we actually were brought in to do the investigation. And then really we're finding once a malware proves successful, once they're learning in one, in one environment that this stuff is, is working, they're, they're really you know, going out there and, 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 and rubber stamping this stuff all over the place. And we often see one, one environment turn into five, then turn into 10, and then turn into 80 or 90. Um, they're all, 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 all infected with the same malware doing the exact same thing. So here's this is something you can actually download once you, once you actually download the presentation. But these are some of the tools we like to use, and of course um, our contact information. Um, you can you can email us um, you know, or, or visit our website, and we're going to actually have have a copy of the presentation posted there as well. All right, thank you so much for thank you so much for uh, being here. We enjoyed it. Thanks for.